Good evening and welcome to Aware on the Air, presented by members and friends of Aware, the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana, a local peace group. I'm Carl Esterbrook. We're recording this at midday on Tuesday, August 28th in the studios of Urbana Public Television. Our subject is the wars the U.S. government is waging around the world and the racism we display to those we're killing in accord with the Latin proverb, proprium humane and geni est, odyssey cum laserus. It's human nature to hate those you have injured. The president is talking peace with North Korea and Russia, but American liberals are appalled that peace might break out because the profits of America's 1% depend on U.S. governments maintaining American economic control of the world. And the way they do it is by threats of war against Russia and China. You may have noticed that when Trump uh, and the leader of North Korea talked peace in Singapore, defense stocks, what, that's what they're called, they mean weapons makers, defense stocks declined sharply. So the U.S. is today making war in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Pakistan, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen, principally to control the flow of oil out of the Middle East and North Africa, which the U.S. uses as a weapon against its economic rivals from Germany to China. Thousands of U.S. troops are killing people in these countries, although most Americans are barely aware of it. More than a quarter of a million U.S. troops are stationed in a thousand U.S. bases on foreign soil, most of them ringing Russia and China. The 70,000 members of the U.S. Special Operations Command are active in three quarters of the countries of the world. Their activities include kidnapping, we call it rendition, torture, and murder. As the rest of the world recognizes, but Americans don't, they're nothing less than American death squads. The rest of the world recognizes that the U.S. is what Martin Luther King called it long ago, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, an international criminal surpassing all others. But most Americans don't know that, protected as they are by government and media propaganda. What we do here at Aware on the Air is try to encourage our fellow citizens to become aware of the killing our government is doing around the world in our name. We're involved in great calm crimes, and we must stop. We have five segments to the, sh to the show tonight, uh, uh, under the best circumstances, about 10 minutes each, uh, on military service and the News Gazette, secondly on Russiagate, three on anti-Semitism, particularly in Britain, four on serfs by Chris Hedges, and five, the death of the late John McCain. Page one, military service. The local fish rap, the News Gazette, uh, has had a long series on those who served, titled Those Who Served, uh, and it records the experiences of veterans of the Vietnam War, the Iraq War, and the many wars that the U.S. has been involved in in their lifetimes. Uh, these are usually stories of the uh, success and uh, uh, certainly survival uh, of the local veterans. But the title, Those Who Served, reminds us of the late George Carlin's remark that the service is a funny name for killing people. The series is an unsubtle justification of the major crimes of our lifetime by the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, the U.S. government. From Vietnam through Afghanistan and Iraq, it profiles military veterans and assumes the justice of their wars. With a torturer now ahead of the CIA, she was called Bloody Gina by her colleagues, uh, and the memory of U.S. torture from Abu Ghraib to Guantanamo, we might approach this series with uh, a little skepticism. Uh, undoubtedly, there is much torture we don't know about, but we do, do know about Abu Ghraib and, and Guantanamo. Uh, the, uh, uh, there are secret programs as well, uh, as we uh, eventually come to find out, uh, that the U.S. government has run uh, since long before uh, Vietnam. Secret not from the victims, of course, 
but from the American people who are rightfully appalled by what they learn about the crimes of U.S. military torture. Today's, uh, your yesterday's uh, feature in the News Gazette is subheadline: most of interrogation is just ask, asking a normal, normal question. But they weren't exactly asking normal questions at Abu Ghraib or Guantanamo. Uh, G Bloody Gina at the head of the CIA was not a asking normal questions when she got that nickname. Uh, this is what we, as Americans, are responsible for. It includes child rape at Abu Ghraib, according to Seymour Hersh, and the many abuses by the military in the war on terror. terror. They are not profiled in the News Gazette series. I realize, of course, that the reporters on the series are not responsible for the subheadlines that the editors put on the article, but uh, it is a bit much, I think, to say most of interrogation is just asking a normal question with this history. The um, death of John McCain has produced a, a good deal of commentary, uh, remarkably uh, positive for this uh, undoubted war criminal. Uh, Kashama Sawant, a socialist politician, economist, and member of the Socialist Alternative, sits on the Seattle City Council, said it better than it best of any of the so-called progressives uh, in American government, uh, most of whom, like Bernie Sanders, praised John McCain. She said, a politician's legacy is a political, not a personal question. An enthusiastic supporter of every imperialist war while in office, John McCain shares responsibilities, responsibility for hundreds of thousands of deaths. To whitewash that is to disrespect those who died in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere, notably Vietnam. This is, uh, seems to me, the only intelligent comment I've heard from American office holders about the death of John McCain. So, uh, the news of the week include the fact that Paul Manafort, described by the New York Times as a longtime lobbyist and political consultant, who worked for multiple Republican candidates and presidents, was convicted of bank fraud, tax fraud, and failure to report a foreign bank account. And Michael Cohen, Donald Trump's former personal lawyer, pled guilty to tax evasion, bank fraud, that is making false statements to obtain loans, and breaking campaign finance laws by paying off two women who claimed to have had sexual affairs with Trump. Because Cohen says, Cohen says those payoffs were made at Trump's direction, this is the one charge that directly implicates Trump. On the basis of these results, the New York Times editorial board insists, quote, only a complete fantasist would continue to claim that this investigation of foreign subversion of an American election, which has already yielded dozens of other indictments and several guilty pleas, is a hoax or scam or rigged witch hunt, close quote. Democrats concur, saying the results put the lie to Mr. Trump's argument that Mr. Mueller was engaged in a political investigation. Who would think that? Close quote. But these crimes are tax fraud, money laundering, and credit app padding that have nothing to do with Donald Trump and campaign finance violations related to what a critic of Trump aptly describes as, quote, a classic B-team type of bumbling screw-up of covering up mistresses, close quote. I question the level of wordplay, if not fantasizing, necessary to claim that these crimes validate this investigation of foreign subversion. None of them has anything to do with that the perils of this, that, these, and those. Do these results disprove that the Mueller probe is a political investigation? I think they imply quite the opposite, and quite obviously so. Why? Because these convictions would not have occurred if Hillary Clinton had been elected president. There would be no convictions because there would have been no investigation. If Hillary had been elected, all the crimes of Manafort and Cohen certainly those that look, took place over, over many years before the election, 
but even I think those having to do with campaign contributions and mistress cover-ups would never have been investigated because all would have been considered right with the political world. The Manafort and Cohen crimes would have been ignored as the standard tactics of elite financial grifting, as well as of parasitism on and payoffs by political campaigns, that they indeed are. Indeed, there would have been no emergency, save our democracy from Russian collaboration special counsel investigation, from which these irrelevant charges were spun off at all. The kinds of antics Manafort and Cohen have been prosecuted for went unnoticed when Donald Trump was a donor to the Democratic and Republican parties, and if he'd stayed in his tower doling out campaign contributions, they still would be. It's only because he foolishly won the presidency against the wishes of the dominant sectors of the ruling class that those antics became the target of prosecutorial investigation. Lesson to Donald. Be careful what you wish for. <clears throat> if Trump weren't such an idiot, he probably would have realized that this is what happens when you run for president without prior authorization from the ruling classes and win. What the New York Times calls a culture of graft as well as corruption that suffused the Trump campaign, I'm quoting here, is part and parcel of a culture of politico-capitalist corruption that suffuses American electoral politics in general. Manafort, who has indeed been, quote, a longtime lobbyist and political consultant, is only one in a long bipartisan line that, quote, enrich themselves by working for some of the world's most notorious thugs and autocrats, close quote. Have you heard of the Podestas, the Clinton Foundation, Besides, the economic purpose of American electoral politics is to funnel millions to consultants in the media. Campaign finance law violations? We'll see how the lawsuit over $84 million worth of funds allegedly transferred illegally from state party contributions to the Clinton campaign works out. Does the media report? Does anybody know or care about it? Will anybody ever go to prison over it? The Republicans and Democrats would just as soon leave this entire culture of graft and corruption undisturbed by the prosecutorial apparatus of the state. That kind of thing can get out of hand. Only because the election of Donald Trump was a mistake from the establishment point of view has that apparatus been sicked on him. The frantic search anywhere and everywhere for some legal charges that can stick to Trump is driven by the burning desire to get something on Donald Trump that will fatally wound him politically and serve as, quote, objective, close quote, grounds for impeachment or resignation. So it's my contention that without the political opposition to Donald Trump as president, none of this legal prosecution would be taking place. The convictions of Manafort and Cohen don't put a lie to the idea that the Mueller investigation is political. They are an effect of the fact that it is. At any rate, there can be no doubt that the Manafort and Cohen convictions have upped the political ante for everybody. Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal, the second wealthiest senator, by the way, his net worth is $80 million, has now invoked the dreaded word from which it's hard to retreat, quote, we are in a Watergate moment, close quote. Yup, the anti-Trump est Trump establishment led by the Democrats has now succeeded via legal ground game in moving the ball into the political red zone where impeachment talk is unavoidable. But going forward from here, the plays, plays and paths available are very dangerous to the establishment and to the Democrats themselves. And the whole game is getting to the point where it can, indeed almost inevitably will, seriously disrupt the system they want to protect. First of all, the Democrats will now face increasing demands for impeachment from the impassioned members of their base whom they've riled up to see Trump as the epitome of the Putin Nazi evil that threatens our democracy. If the Democrats insist these convictions are not just matters of financial hijinks, irrelevant to Mueller's Russia collusion investigation, and irrelevant in fact to anything of political substance, if they assert that the payoffs to Stormy and Karen the only acts directly involving Trump, disqualify Trump for the presidency, 
then they will have no excuse but to call for Trump's impeachment and act to make it happen. Their base will demand that Democratic candidates run on that promise, and if the Democrats retake the House, that they begin impeachment proceedings immediately. Uh, the Democrats might control the House after the fall elections, and the House of Representatives uh, is where impeachment begins under our system. So after all uh, the, quote, only a complete fa fantasist talk, the Democrats don't act to impeach Trump. They will further alienate their base and drive more liberals and progressives to withhold their votes, if not abandon the party altogether. And the evil Putin and Nazi Trump will be strengthened. If they try to impeach and fail, which is likely, well then, as happened to the Republicans with Clinton, they will just look stupid and will be punished for having wasted the nation's political time and energy foolishly, and Trump will be strengthened. If they were to impeach, convict, and remove Trump, even by forcing a resignation, a large swath of the population would conclude correctly that a ginned-up litigation had been used to overturn the results of the 2016 election, that the Democrats had gotten away with what the Republicans couldn't in 1998 and 99. That swath of the population would likely withdraw completely from electoral politics, leaving all their problems and resentments intact, hidden for a while, but sure to erupt in some other ways. It would deeply undermine any notion that the political system holds the confidence of the people and intensify division, disruption, and a sense of incipient civil war in the country more than any number of Russian Facebook posts. Furthermore, if the Democrats were successful in removing Trump, their own base would be confronted with the terrible beauty of the Pence presidency to which they had given birth. After such a fight, Pence, who is a much more serious, organized, and ideologically coherent religious proto-fascist than Trump, will benefit from the inevitable propensity of Democrats to calm things down and protect the stability of the system. Progressive Democrats will find again that the two-party system has produced no good result. In other words, the result of a successful impeachment effort might very well be more disaffection from our democracy by Democrats. In short, through a process of litigation and prosecution, the Democrats are getting what they asked for. The field of political discourse and action will now increasingly center on the possibility of removing or impeaching the president. Given their construction of the Manafort-Cohen verdicts, they must move forward on that or they will be perceived as weak and backpedaling and Trump will be strengthened. But if they do move forward, they will initiate a political battle that will tear the country apart and end up either with their defeat or the victory of Mike Pence. Of course, the Democratic leadership knows all this, which is why they have always said they do not want to push for impeachment or removal and probably will not. They also know, and they know that Trump supporters know, that a campaign law violation has no more political substance than Bill Clinton's perjury. They know that they are not likely to win that fight in the Senate. They know the can of worms they are opening with charges could be levied against most rich politicians. And most importantly, they know the fight they will have to wage will be intensely divisive and will deeply undermine confidence in the political system, however it ends up. The Democrats much prefer to have Trump in office to kick around politically. The most likely scenario is that they will make a cloakroom agreement with Republicans not to go too far, while they continue to whip up Trump Putin Russiagate fever among their constituency. They will continue to stoke anticipation of a smoking collusion gun from Mueller, which will probably never come. The Democrats are not really after impeaching Trump, they're after stringing along their progressive voters. In the meantime, the delightful Trump effect, his constant embarrassment of American political self righteousness and discomforting of both political parties, will continue apace. By the way, for those who think that Manafort's conviction portends a smoking gun based on his work for pro Kremlin Viktor Yanukovych, as the New York Times and other liberals persistently call him, I would suggest looking at the Twitter thread by Aaron Maté. 
It's a brilliant shredding of Rachel Maddow's, and to a lesser extent, Charles Hayes, version of the deceptive implication, presented as indisputable fact, that Manafort's work for Yanukovych, Yanukovych is proof that he, and by extension Trump, was working for Putin. As Matei shows, this is actually indisputably false. Manafort was working hard to turn Yanukovych away from Russia to the EU and the West, and the evidence of that is abundant and easily available. It was given in the trial, though you'd never know that from reading the New York Times or listening to MSNBC. As a former Ukraine foreign ministry spokesman said, quote, if it weren't for Paul, Ukraine would have gone under Russia much earlier. He was the one dragging Yanukovych to the West, close quote. And the Democrats know this. And if you think Cohen is harboring secret knowledge of Trump-Russia collusion that he's going to turn over to Mueller, take a look at Matei's thread on that. We're now entering a new period of intense political maneuvering that's the latest turning point in the bizarre and flimsy Russiagate narrative. I've been asked to comment on that a number of times over the last two years, and each time I or one of my fellow commentators would say, why are we still talking about this? It was originally conjured up as a Clinton campaign attack on Trump, but to my and many others' surprise and chagrin, it somehow morphed into the central theme of political opposition to Trump's presidency. Donald Trump is a horrid political specimen. I witnessed his flourishing into apex narcissism and corruption over decades in New York City, as chronicled by the dogged reporter Wayne Barrett. And I would be surprised if there weren't financial, cri financial crimes in his closet that any competent prosecutor could ferret out. Anyone who knows his history knows that this is the kind of dirt the Mueller investigation was most likely to find on Donald Trump. Anyone who's honest knows that this kind of dirt it was meant to find. Russiagate was a pretext to dig around everywhere in his closet. Trump was clueless about the trap he was setting for himself, and has been relentlessly foolish in dealing with it. It is a witch hunt, and he's riding around in his broom, skywriting self-incriminating tweets. There are a thousand reasons to criticize Donald Trump. His racism, his stupidity, his infantile narcissism, his full embrace of Zionist colonialism with its demand to attack Iran, his enactment of Republican social and economic policies that are destroying working class lives, and the like. That he is a Kremlin agent is not one of them. His election was a symptom of deep pathologies of American political culture that we must address, including the failure of the so-called liberal party and of the two-party system itself. That Donald Trump is a Russian agent is not one of them. There are a number of very good justifications for seeking his impeachment, starting with the clear constitutional crime of launching a military attack on another country without congressional authorization. That he is a Kremlin agent is not one of them. Unfortunately, the Democratic Party and its allied media do not want to center the fight on these substantive political issues. Instead, they are centering on this barrage of Russiagate litigation, none of which yet proves or even charges Russian collusion, which they're using as a substitute for politics. And in place of opposition, they're substituting uncritical loyalty to the heroes of the military intelligence complex <clears throat> and our democracy, in quotes, that only a complete fantasist could stomach. I mean, when you get to the point that you're suspecting, you're suspecting John Bolton of ties to Russia, something very strange has happened. Now with the Manafort and Cohen convictions, the Russiagate discourse is moving to a new stage, and it's unlikely that we will ever stop talking about it as long as Trump is president. Nothing good can come of it. Our country is in and on the verge of multiple crises that threaten to destroy it. That Donald Trump is a Russian agent is not one of them. Political time is precious. What a waste. You're watching We're on the Air. We're talking about the uh, political situation in the United States today with special reference to war. Um, for a uh, comparison, I want to talk for a minute about, uh, for a couple of minutes, about the companion case in Britain. 
what Russiagate is in the United States, a fake political uh, movement designed to maintain the warlike stance of the U.S. against Russia and China, uh, what Russiagate is in the U.S., uh, anti-Semitism is in England or in Britain these, these days. And it centers on uh, the quite remarkable uh, leader of uh, the Labor Party, Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, and I suggest that if we look at what's going on in Britain, we have, a, if not exactly a mirror, we have a comparison with the Russiagate nonsense uh, in this country. Uh, this piece is from Jonathan Cook, uh, a, uh, an Englishman who lives in Nazareth uh, in Israel and uh, writes about uh, the Middle, East, Middle Eastern politics. Besieged for four years with charges of anti-Semitism, Jeremy Corbyn's allies in the labor leadership have largely lost the stomach for battle, one that was never about substance or policy, but about character assassination, says Jonathan Cook. This article is entitled, Corbyn's Labor, and that they mean the party, the uh, political party, roughly equivalent to the Democrats in this country. Corbyn's later labor is being made to fail by design. The Labor Party, relentlessly battered by an organized campaign of smears of its leader, Jeremy Corbyn, first for being anti-Semitic, and now for honoring Palestinian terrorists, is reportedly about to adopt the four additional working examples of anti-Semitism drafted by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Uh, this is a IHRA. This IHRA uh, would be described as part of the Israel lobby uh, in this country. Leave the labor when Cook says labor here, he means the Labor Party. Labor initially rejected these examples, these examples of anti-Semitism that uh, uh, were to be uh, rejected by the Labor Party. Uh, labor initially rejected using these as standards, as examples, to determine who was anti-Semitic. Uh, parallels with the McCarthy uh, campaign in this country uh, long ago and the Russiagate con controversy today are uh, pretty clear. The point is to find out who these secret uh, evildoers actually are who've infected our political parties or their political parties. Labor initially rejected these examples uh, that purported to be accounts of anti-Semitism, stoking yet more condemnation from Israel's lobbyists and the British corporate media because it justifiably feared, as have prominent legal experts, that accepting them would severely curb the freedom to criticize Israel. The media's ever more outlandish slurs against Corbyn and the Labor Party's imminent capitulation on the IHRA's full definition of Emmy's anti-Semitism are not unrelated events. The former was designed to bring about the latter. According to a report in The Guardian, the leading British paper, last week, senior party figures, Labor Party, are agitated for the rapid adoption of the full IHRA definition. What this definition does is describe um, uh, anti-Semitism uh, in such a way as to include any criticism of Israel. Uh, it's a defense of Israel under the banner of opposition to anti-Semitism. According to a report in The Guardian last week, senior party figures are agitating the rapid adoption of the full IHRA definition, ideally before the party conference next month, and say Corbyn has effectively surrendered to the pressure. An MP, a member of parliament, who supports Cor Corbyn told the paper Corbyn would, quote, just have to take one for the team, close quote. In a strong indication of the way the wind is blowing, The Guardian added, quote, the party said it would consult the main Jewish communal bodies as well as experts and academics, but groups such as the pro-Corbyn Jewish Voice for Labor have not been asked to give their views. The full adoption of the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism will be a major victory both for Israel and its apologists in Britain, 
who've been seeking to silence all meaningful criticism of Israel, and for the British corporate media, which would dearly love to see the back of an old-school socialist labor leader whose program threatens to loosen the 40-year stranglehold of neoliberalism on British society. And of course, it's Corbyn. Besieged for four years, Corbyn's allies and the labor leadership have largely lost the stomach for battle, one that was never about substance or policy, but about character assassination. As the stakes have been constantly up by the media and the Blairite holdouts, that's the followers of the former Prime, Prime Minister, Tony Blair, uh, and the Blairite holdouts in the party of bureaucracy, the inevitable has happened. Corbyn has been abandoned. Few respected politicians with career ambitions or a public profile want to risk being cast out into the wilderness like Ken Livingstone, uh, former mayor of London, as an anti-Semite. This is why the supposed anti-Semitism crisis in a Corbyn-led Labour Party has been so much more effective than berating him for his clothes or his patriotism. That indeed was attacks on him from earlier on. Natural selection, survival of the smear fittest for the job, meant that a weaponized anti-Semitism would eventually identify Corbyn as its prime target and not just his supporters, especially after his unexpectedly strong showing at the polls in last year's election. Worse, Corbyn himself has conceded too much ground on anti-Semitism. As a lifelong anti-racism campaigner, the accusations of anti-Semitism have clearly pained him. He has tried to placate rather than defy the smearers. He has tried to maintain unity with people who have no interest in finding common ground with him. And as he has lost all sense of how to respond in good faith to allegations made in bad faith, he's begun committing the cardinal sin of sounding and looking evasive, just as those who deployed the anti-Semitism charge hoped. It was his honesty, plain speaking, and compassion that won him the leadership of the Labor Party and the love of ordinary members. Unless he can regain the political and spiritual confidence that underpinned those qualities, he risks hemorrhaging support. And beyond Corbyn's personal fate, the Labor Party has now reached a critical juncture in its response to a smear campaign. In adopting the full IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, the party will jettison the principle of free speech and curtail critical debate about an entire country, Israel, as well as a key foreign policy issue for those concerned about the direction the Middle East is taking. Discussion of what kind of state Israel is, what its policy goals are, and whether they're compatible with a peace process are about to be taken off the table by Britain's largest supposedly progressive party. You see the parallels here, by the way, with Russia again, eh? The thought spurred me, this is Jonathan Cook writing about this, the thought spurred me to cast an eye over my back catalog of journalism. I've been based in Nazareth, in Israel's Galilee, since 2001. In that time, I have written, according to my website, more than 900 articles, plus another few hundred blog posts on Israel, as, three as, peer, as well as three peer-reviewed books, and a clutch of chapters in edited collections. That's a lot of writing. Many more than a million words about Israel over nearly two decades. What shocked me, however, as I started to pore over these articles, was that almost all of them, except for the handful dealing with internal Palestinian politics, would fall foul of at least one of the four additional IHRA examples labor is about to adopt. In other words, they would, under the standard, be considered anti-Semitic. After 17 years about writing about Israel, of writing about Israel, after winning a respected journalism prize for being, quote, one of the reliable truth-tellers in the Middle East, close quote, the Labor Party is about to declare that I, and many others like me, are irredeemable anti-Semites. Not that I'm unused to such slurs. I'm intimately familiar with a community of online stalkers who happily throw around the insults Nazi and anti-Semite at anyone who doesn't cheerlead the settlements of the Greater Israel Project. 
But far more troubling is that this will be my designation not by bullying Israel partisans, but by the official party of the British left. Of course, I will not be alone. Much of my journalism has been about documenting and reporting the careful work of scholars, human rights groups, lawyers, and civil society organizations, Palestinian, Israeli, and international alike, that have charted the structural racism in Israel's legal and administrative system, explaining them often in exasperating detail its ethnocentric character and its apartheid policies. All of us are going to be effectively cast out denied any chance to inform or contribute to the debates and policies of Britain's only left-wing party with a credible shot at power. That is a shocking realization. The Labour Party is about to slam the door shut in the faces of the Palestinian people, as well as progressive Jews and others who stand in solidarity with them. The article in The Guardian, the newspaper that has done more to damage Corbyn than any other, by undermining him from within his own camp, described the incorporation of the full IHRA anti-Semitism definition into Labor's code of conduct as a, quote, compromise, close quote, as though the betrayal of an oppressed people was something over which middle ground could be found. Remember that the man who drafted the IHRA definition and its associated examples, American Jewish lawyer Kenneth Stern, has publicly regretted their impact, saying that in practice they have severely curbed freedom of speech about Israel. How these new examples will be misused by Corbyn's opponents should already be clear. He made his most egregious mistake in the handling of the party's supposed anti-Semitism crisis precisely to avoid getting caught up in a violation of one of the IHRA examples Labor is about to adopt, comparing Israel to Nazi Germany. He apologized for attending an anti-racism event and distanced himself from a friend, the late Hayo Meyer, a Holocaust survivor and defender of Palestinian rights, who used his speech to compare Israel's current treatment of Palestinians to early Nazi laws that vilified and oppressed Jews. It was a Judas-like act for which it is not necessary to berate Corbyn. He is doubtless already torturing himself over what he did. But that's the point. The adoption of the full IHRA definition will demand the constant vilification and rooting out of progressive and humane voices like Myers. It will turn the Labor Party into the modern equivalent of Senator Joe McCarthy's House of Un-American Activities Committee. House Un-American Activities Committee. Labor activists will find themselves, like Corbyn, either outed or required to out others as supposed anti-Semites. They will have to denounce reasonable criticism of Israel and dissociate themselves from supporters of the Palestinian cause even Holocaust survivors. The patent absurdity of labor including this new anti-Semitism example should be obvious the moment we consider that it will rec recast not only Meyer and other Holocaust survivors as anti-Semites, but leading Jewish intellectual and scholars, even Israeli army generals. Two years ago, Yair Golan, the deputy chief of staff of the Israeli military, went public with such a comparison. Addressing, in Israel, addressing an audience in Israel on Holocaust Day, he spoke of where Israel was heading. Quote, If there is something that frightens me about Holocaust remembrance, it's the recognition of the revolting processes that occurred in Europe in general, and particularly in Germany, back then, 70, 80, and 90 years ago, and finding signs of them here among us today in 2016, close quote. Hence the Israeli general. Is it not a paradox that were Golan, the general, a member of the Labor Party, that statement, a rare moment of self-reflection by a senior Israeli figure, will soon justify his being vilified and hounded out of the Labor Party? Looking at my own work, Jonathan Cook writes, it's clear that almost all of it falls foul of two further examples of anti-Semitism cited in the full IHRA definition that labor is preparing to adopt. 
quote, applying double standards by requiring of Israel a behavior not expected or demanded of any other democratic nation, close quote. And two, denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination, e.g., by claiming that the existence of the state of Israel is a racist endeavor, close quote. These are two things you can't do without be considering an, be consider, being considered an anti-Semite and excluded from the Labor Party under the standards that Cook is talking about. When Harley needs to point out how preposterous it, is, preposterous it is that the Labor Party is about to outlaw from internal discussion or review any research, scholarship, or journalism that violates these two examples, weeks after Israel passed its nation-state basic law. That law, which has constitutional weight, makes explicit what was always implicit in Israel as a Jewish state. One, that Israel privileges the rights and status of Jews around the world, including those who have never even visited Israel, above the rights of a fifth of the country's citizens who are non-Jews, the remnants of the native Palestinian population who survived the ethnic cleansing campaign of 1948. Two, that Israel is defined in the basic law as not a state bounded by internationally recognized borders, but rather the land of Israel, a biblical conception of Israel whose borders encompass the occupied Palestinian territories and parts of many neighboring states. How one might reasonably wonder is such a state defined this way in the basic law just adopted by Israel, a normal democratic state, how is it not structurally racist and inherently acquisitive of other people's territory? Contrary to the demands of these two IHRA examples, the basic law alone shows that Israel is a racist endeavor and that we cannot judge it by the same standards we would a normal Western-style democracy. Not least, it has a double border problem. It forces Jews everywhere to be included in its self-definition of the nation, whether they want to be or not, and it lays claim to the title deeds of other territories without any intention to confer on their non-Jewish inhabitants the rights it accords Jews. Demanding that we treat Israel as a normal Western-style normal Western liberal democracy, as the AHRA full definition requires, makes as much sense as having demanded the same for apartheid South Africa back in the 1980s. The Labor Party has become the largest in Europe, as Corbyn has attracted huge numbers of newcomers into its membership, inspired by a new kind of politics. That is a terrifying development for the old politics, which preferred tiny political cliques, accountable chiefly to corporate donors, leaving a slightly wider circle of activists largely powerless. That is why the Blairite holdouts in the party bureaucracy, the early labor establishment, earlier labor establishment, that's why the Blairite holdouts in the party bureaucracy are quite content to use any pretext not only to root out genuine progressive activists drawn to a Corbyn-led party, including anti-Zionist Jewish activists, but to alienate tens of thousands more members that have begun to transform labor into a grassroots movement. A party endlessly obsessing about anti-Semitism, a party that has abandoned the Palestinians, a party that has begun throwing out key progressive principles, a party that has renounced free speech, a party that no longer puts the interests of the poor and vulnerable at the center of its concerns, is a party that will fail. That is where the anti-Semitism crisis is leading labor, precisely as it was designed to do. Now, it doesn't take much effort to take this description offered by Jonathan, Cump, Trump, <laughs> Jonathan Cook of the party, uh, the British Labor Party, and comparing it to the Russiagate uh, uh, activities of the Democratic Party in this country. Uh, the situations uh, bear uh, da a dangerous similarity. You're watching Aware on the Air. We have a few minutes left to turn to... Uh, uh, one other there that uh, uh, takes us uh, from politics in the U.S. to politics in uh, Britain to the economic situation in the U.S. today, uh, which underlies, of course, the uh, uh, 
political activities, particularly the warlike activities being carried on by uh, the American political establishment. Uh, America's belligerence uh, that makes it uh, regarded as the most dangerous country in the world uh, in international polls, uh, America's belligerence is primarily a matter of maintaining its economic dominance, uh, particularly against the growing economic integration of Eurasia as Russia and China and now, finally, including Iran as well. Uh, this is the great uh, opponent uh, of uh, the American ruling class, of the American ascendancy, uh, and in order to keep that economic integration off balance, that Eurasian uh, agglomeration that's occurring uh, at the moment, the U.S. threatens war and indeed carries on war uh, in at least eight scenes around the world. Uh, this is a, a, a serious political problem for the entire world, not just for the local politics of the United States. <coughs> Nevertheless, it is the local politics of the United States, particularly the economic status of the American people, uh, that threatens uh, this procedure, and uh, the greatest threat, of course, was the election of Donald Trump, uh, who was the first presidential candidate in 40 years, to attack the neoliberal and neoconservative policies, the policies of more war and more inequality that characterized the last administration, the one before that, uh, and going back many years. Uh, Trump is no prize, but what he said spoke to the real condition of Americans and the way in which uh, the American elite uh, in the age of neoliberalism has confiscated their life possibilities and the extent to which it, Americans recognize that uh, produced uh, the election of Donald Trump. Chris Hedges writes, you know the statistics. Income inequality in the United States has not been this pronounced in over a century. The top 10% has 50% of the country's income, and the upper 1% has 20% of the country's income. A quarter of American workers struggle on wages of less than $10 an hour, putting them below the poverty line, while the income of the average CEO of a major corporation is more than 300 times the pay of his or her average worker, a massive increase given that in the 1950s, the average CEO made 20 times what his or her worker made. This income inequality is global. The richest 1% of the world's population controls 40% of the world's wealth, and it's getting worse. What will the consequences of this inequality be economically and politically? How much worse will it get with the imposition of austerity programs and a new tax code that slashes rates for corporations, allowing companies to hoard money or buy back their own stock rather than invest in the economy? How will we endure as health care insurance premiums steadily rise and social and public welfare programs such as Medicaid, Pell Grants, and food stamps are cut. And under the tax code revision signed by President Trump this December, rates will increase over the long term for the working class. Over the next decade, the revision will cost the nation roughly $1.5 trillion. Where will this end? We live in a new feudalism. We've been stripped of political power. Workers are trapped in menial jobs, forced into crippling debt, and paid stagnant or declining wages. Chronic poverty and exploitative working conditions in many parts of the world, and increasingly in the United States, replicate the hell endured by industrial workers at the end of the 19th century. The complete capture of ruling institutions by corporations and their oligarchic elites, including the two dominant political parties, the courts and the press, means there is no mechanism left by which we can reform the system or protect ourselves from mounting abuse. We will revolt or become 21st century serfs, forced to live in misery and brutally oppressed by militarized priests and the most sophisticated security and surveillance system in human history, while the ruling oligarchs continue to wallow in unimagined wealth and opulence. 
Quote, the new tax code is explosive excess, the economist Richard Walsh said when we spoke in New York. We've had 30 or 40 years where corporations paid less taxes than they ever did. They made more money than they ever did. They've been able to keep wages stagnant while the productivity of labor rose. This is the last moment historically they need another big gift, let alone at the expense of the very people whose wages have been stagnant. To give them a tax bust of this uh, sort, basically reducing from 35% to 20%, is a 40% cut. This kind of crazy excess reminds you of the kings of France before the French Revolution, when the level of excess reached an explosive social dimension. That's where we are, close quote. That's, uh, uh, that's Richard Wolff, uh, the uh, economist. When, capitalists collapsed, when capitalism collapsed in the 1930s, the response of the working class was to form unions, strike, and protest. The workers pitted power against power. They forced the oligarchs to respond with the New Deal, which created 12 million government-funded jobs, social security, the minimum wage, and unemployment compensation. The country's infrastructure was modernized and maintained. The Civilian Conservation Corps alone employed 300,000 workers to form and, main, form and maintain national parks. I remember years ago when I first took a trip through the Northwest of the United States, I was astonished to see how much of that whole area that was used for recreation uh, and indeed living uh, had been constructed by the Civilian Conservation Corps uh, in the Roosevelt administration. Uh, this was a uh, way to stave off revolution, finally. Quote, the message of the organized working class was unequivocal, Wolf said. Either you help us through this depression, or there will be a revolution, close quote. The New Deal po programs were paid for by taxing the rich. Even in the 1950s, during the Eisenhower pre presidency, the top marginal ra rate, tax rate, was 91%. The rich, enraged, amounted a war to undo these programs and restore the social inequality that makes them wealthy at our expense. We speak of today as neoliberalism. We've come full circle. Dissidents, radicals, and critics of capitalism are once again branded as agents of foreign powers and purged from universities and the airwaves. The labor movement has been dismantled including through so-called right-to-work laws that prohibit agreements between unions and employers. The last remaining regulation is to thwart pillage, corporate pillage and pollution are removed. Although government is the only mechanism we have to protect ourselves from predatory oligarchs and corporations, the rich tell us that government is the problem, not the solution. Austerity in a bloated and out-of-control military budget along with a privatization of public services and institutions such as utilities and public educations, we are assured, are the way to economic growth. And presiding over this assault and unchecked kleptocracy are the con artist in chief and his billionaire friends from the fossil fuel and war industries and elsewhere on Wall Street. The elites cook statistics to lie about a recovery from the 2008 global financial cra crash. To gather unemployment statistics, for example, government agents ask people two questions. Are you working? If, the answer, if they answer yes, their count is employed, even if they have a temporary job in which they work only an hour a week. If they say no, they're asked if they're looking for work. If they have not looked for work in the last four weeks, they are magically erased from the unemployment rolls. Then there is the long list of those not counted as unemployed, such as prisoners, the retired, stay-at-home spouses, and high school and college students who want jobs. Alternative facts did not begin with Donald Trump. Quote, you don't have to be a statistical genius to understand that over the last 10 years, a significant number of people gave up looking because it's too disgusting, Will said. The jobs they were offered were inferior to what they had before or so insecure that it made their family life impossible. They went back to school, went into the illegal economy, or began to live off their friends, relatives, and neighbors, or also, we might point out, went into the military. 
The quality of the jobs, the security, the benefits, and the impact on physical and mental health have been cascading downwards as the wages remain stagnant, he went on. We're not in a recovery. We're in an ongoing decline, which, by the way, is why Mr. Trump got elected. This is, the happening, this is happening to capitalism in Western Europe, Japan, and the United States. This is why an angry working class is looking for ways to express and change its circumstances. Society has a responsibility to itself, Wolf said. If the private sector can't or won't manage that, then the public sector has to, has to step in. It's what Franklin Roosevelt said when he came on the radio. If there are millions of Americans who ask for nothing other than a job and the private sector can't provide it, then it's up to me. Who else is going to do it? If we cut back on welfare, we're making people depend on the private sector. What happens to people thrown on a private capital se sector that cannot and will not function in a socially acceptable way? You've been watching Aware on the Air, presented by members and friends of Aware, the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana, a local peace group, recorded in the studios of Urbana Public Television on August 28th. In the 35th week of 2018, another week in which the world can see the most extensive global terrorism is U.S. worldwide war making. Our show is produced and directed by Jason Liggett. Thanks to him also, this program and others like it will be available on YouTube and archive.org. By thanks tonight to Dr. No, J.B. Nicholson for research. See No's notes on the Facebook page for Aware on the Air, along with articles referred to tonight. There's an anti-war demonstration this coming Saturday, 2 to 4 p.m. in downtown Champaign at the intersection of Church, Main, and Neal Streets. There's an open aware meeting this coming Sunday, 5 to 6 p.m. at Hammerhead Coffee, University Avenue at Wright Street on the northeast edge of the campus. Finally, aware honors those who reveal the crimes of the U.S. government, which the rest of the world knows about but Americans don't, Manning, Assange, Snowden, and others, who are truth tellers persecuted by the U.S. government. Particularly, by the way, our liberal Democrat Senator Durbin, a shill for the Russiagate propaganda. Now, this is Carl Estenbrook for members and friends of the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana saying the words of the late Edward Murrow, good night and good luck.